Welcome to Overcoming Medica Hair Loss Summit. My name is Valerie Fuentes. I'm your host. And today I am with Anila Inani. She's a co-founder and marketing lead at Habit Award. For more than 20 years, Anila hit her battle with compulsive hair pulling disorder called trichotillomania. And if this is a mental health condition. After sharing her secret, she created Habit Aware and created King, which is a smart bracelet that uses gesture detection technology to bring awareness to hair pulling, uh, skin picking, and nail biting. Um, this issue affects about 20 million Americans. So imagine how powerful this new invention is. I am so excited to have you here, Anila. Thank you for accepting my invitation. Oh, thank you for having me. I was just overjoyed to be able to join this summit because everything that you're talking about just resonates so much with the pain that I've gone through as a child with this condition um, and knowing also the, the future of how bright and hopeful it can be once you have the right tools at your fingertips. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about your journey. Like when did you start uh, noticing that this was happening? Yeah, so I started uh, pulling out my hair. It's called trichotillomania. Mm -hmm. I started pulling out my hair probably in my early teens. I don't remember exactly when, but around 10, 11, 12 years old, around like the time puberty hit. Mm -hmm. And for me and for many others, it's basically a this kind of urge that you feel like you need to pull out your hair. And it's really a sense of relief in the moment. Like it's mm -hmm. a coping mechanism for stress, anxiety, mm -hmm. even boredom. Um, and I was a natural, I was a, a thumb sucker when I was a kid. So I was already using my body to self soothe. And then I was a hair twirler. And then this was sort of the next progression. Um, so it's a mental health condition where you are using your body to self soothe and the umbrella term is actually called body focused repetitive behaviors. And so you mm -hmm. mentioned skin picking and nail biting. So these are mm -hmm. other sister conditions like hair pulling where you're using your body, your mind is restless and that translates to these restless hands where you don't really you haven't really been taught or you haven't learned how to, to deal with that negative energy in a positive right. way. And so your body is just trying to deal with it however it can in a very um, trance-like manner. Okay. And so how is this typically treated? So typical treatments are generally the gold standard is cognitive behavioral therapy, which mm -hmm. is... So actually, let me, let me back up a little bit. Yep. How do you get diagnosed? Like, how do I know this is trichotillomania? Yeah, so that's actually a very interesting question because a lot of people don't want to talk about this issue. They don't want to go to their doctor and say, oh, I pull out my hair or I pick at my skin and it's becoming mm -hmm. something that I cannot control mm -hmm. because we are, we are afraid. There's this perception of choice. There's this perception that we choose to pull, we choose to pick, we choose to bite our nails when really it's like, the, the subconscious mind that's making that decision for us. Mm -hmm. And because of that perception of choice, other people, you know, feel like, ew, why can't you just stop? Or that's weird. Or you, you kind of get m met with that kind of reaction. So you, you hold it in, you, you hold it inside. So the way I found out was, okay, I started in my tens, in my teens and I found out at 22, simply Googling, why do I pull out my hair? And that's when mm -hmm. it came up, trichotillomania, con mental health condition. And that's how a lot of people find out. They find mm -hmm. each other in these online forums and they seek help from each other versus going to an expert. Okay. And so, so then in order to have treatment, which you were going to tell me about that, would yep. I go see a mental health specialist? Yep. So there's... Okay. Yeah, so the gold standard of treatment is cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm -hmm. And that's really taking you through a system of learning about how your thoughts impact your behavior. Mm -hmm. At the core of that is awareness. You need to know what's happening in order for you to change it. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with cognitive behavioral therapy is just it's the inaccessibility of it. And that can mean from a cost perspective, of you know your health insurance might not cover mm -hmm. mental health coverage um, from a time perspective like you may not have the luxury of a job that allows you that one hour a week to yeah, go therapy. for a session yeah. and 
quite simply, you may not have a treatment professional in your area that understands these behaviors, body focused repetitive behaviors, because you may walk into a psychologist's office and if they haven't studied this condition, they might try to treat you with what they do know, which right. may not be the right treatment, or they might just say, again, just, oh, just stop, right? And mm -hmm. then if you met with that sort of reaction, then it, it kind of turns you off to therapy. So right. it's very important to try to find someone that understands these conditions. And there's a nonprofit called um, the TLC Foundation for Body Focused Repetitive Behaviors. Mm -hmm. It's a mouthful, but the website is just bfrb.org, and they have a provider mm -hmm. directory, so you can find someone that's actually been trained by them to treat these conditions. Okay. Awesome. That sounds ugh, a lot to like what I've been through, and so I, the reason why I invited you is because I love that you made something good out of this condition. Like you created something that helped you get to the other side and is helping a lot of people. So um, before we go there, I do want to know, like, how was it? Were you in a relationship when you decided to talk about it or when you found out? Because for me personally, um, having alopecia, I hid that for years. <laughs> Yeah. And it wasn't until recently that I told my husband about it because I know that for us women and actually for anybody for that matter, it's like really hard to talk about this with, uh, you know, our partners or even if we're dating. Um, it's kind of like you have this thoughts of we don't want them to think that there's something wrong with us. And yeah. So tell me about that. How would you how did you manage uh, this condition in your relationships? Yeah. So going back to how people treat the condition. A lot of people just kind of ignore it or cover it up with wigs or makeup. So for me, my pull, major pull areas are eyebrows and eyelashes. Other people are you okay. know, all over their head, their arms, their legs, sometimes their pubic area. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it was eyebrows, eyelashes. So I would cover up with eye makeup, with an eye pencil. And yeah, I, I didn't want anyone to know. Again, I think we're, women are held to a higher standard of beauty and our hair is everything our value yeah, i mean like yeah right yeah like our hair is our value and it's kind of that's probably a whole other conversation yep. <laughs> um so yeah, yeah i mean i hid i didn't want i didn't want someone who i was falling in love with to think that i was defective in any way that was kind of i still didn't understand what it was at that time you know so mm -hmm. that was sort of i'm just going to hide this i'm just going to cover it up and the more now what I've realized is the more that you hide it, the more that those secrets make you sick. You hold mm -hmm. on to that and it, it festers in your mind. It actually makes it worse because you're constantly, you can't show up as, you, as your authentic self in a meeting or on a date because you're constantly worrying, can they tell, do they see, like why are they looking at me right now? Yeah. Um, you know, like are they thinking there's something wrong with me? And so, what I'm trying to impart to people in our community is that letting go of this secret is the, is the best, <laughs> the best, it's the best because it's once you can get over that hurdle, like you can just drop your bags and, and fly in a sense. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's really where I was when it was came to dating and even friendship. Like I didn't really tell anyone. Mm -hmm. And then a few years ago, my husband, so, you know, the guy that I promised in sickness and health and we dated for years and he just never knew because I had gotten really good at hiding it. Mm -hmm. um, he caught me with that eyebrows one day. I just was going to the bathroom to get my eyebrow pencil and there he was and we bumped into each other and he was just like, where are your eyebrows? And this was right after we had a baby. And again, hormonal change, I think, really impacted my pulling behavior. Also, mm -hmm. kind of being at home on maternity leave, my son was just a little baby. And I would, you know, breastfeed him and just be pulling or read to him and be pulling. And I was kind of alone in that. Like, there was no one to, to say, hey, what are you doing? So I was pulling a lot more. And it was much more apparent before that I was able to kind of game it a little bit a little bit here a little bit there kind of balance mm -hmm. it out but those months of maternity leave were just I was alone in my thoughts and yeah. it those again the restless mind fed the restless hands then um 
and he caught me. And that was the moment that I shared what was happening. Okay. Yeah. So, um, to, just to share a little bit more about my story on that hiding piece. Um, so I was diagnosed with alopecia when I was 24, I started losing my hair when I was a uh, teenager. So 16, 18. Um, but I was in a really, um, bad relationship. Like it wasn't, it wasn't a good relationship at all. And so I thought I was, I was losing my hair because of that, mm -hmm. um, because of stress. And so when I went to a doctor and they told me I had alopecia, first reaction, denial, no, no way. Go to another doctor, another doctor, another doctor. Then, you know, I finally got, okay, this is, this is what I have. And I'm going to continue to lose my hair. And, um, but then I spent, I want to say like my early twenties, almost to 30, trying to grow my hair back. Mm -hmm. And that's all I wanted to do. And like all my energy went to trying to get my, my hair back, all my money, all my energy, all my thoughts, all my everything I spend trying to grow my hair back. Um, and so how that impacted me in dating was like what you were saying, it's impossible or it was impossible for me to have connected conversations because I will be talking to you and thinking, can you see that this is not my real hair? Can you see that this is, you know, like my hair is falling on? Uh, what are you thinking? And so like every time I will feel that somebody was looking at my forehead or my head, I will change the conversation. So like my conversations were never, uh, they never made sense because it would be like, Oh, look, another bird. Or like, <laughs> just trying to distract people. Yeah, yeah. And the worst part about that is that sometimes people are not even looking. It's all in our head. Yeah, it's all, right? everyone is so worried about what other people are seeing about them that we're all intro. We're all focused on the inside on our issues, right? Yeah. We're not realizing we're not, and then that's a block on both sides. We're not able to connect with one another. Yeah. I know. Yeah. And so, um, so then I met my husband and actually when I met him, I, I wasn't wearing hair yet. I was just, you know, I lost my hair, but I also, you know, after almost 10 years have become an expert on, you know, masking it up, like you said, with the sprays and headbands and all the things. So he met me and I was say I wasn't wearing hair back then. And then, um, I don't know, a little bit after we started dating, I started wearing extensions and the hair piece and all this stuff. And I left it at that because in my mind, he met me without hair, right? Without the extensions, without the, the, the hair that I purchased. Yeah. So in my mind, I was, that was honest, right? I'm not hiding anything. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I never, I never wanted to share with him, you know, this is the thing, this is a diagnosis, because like you said, you don't want them to think that, um, you know, there's something wrong with you or yeah. I don't know. So then last year, after over 10 years, so my first diagnosis, I decided to go back to the doctor because I felt that, you know, it's been 10 years, maybe something came out. I've already tried everything, but I had the hope. And so I went to a doctor and same thing. She said, you know, it's alopecia, you know, gave me all the numbers and the ratios of my hair and how much hair I have and how much hair I'm losing and bottom line is it's not good. Um, so I went home and I was devastated. I feel like I, I mean, I, I was diagnosed over 10 years ago, but I felt everything again yeah. literally last year. Um, and so I decided to share with my husband and cause I, up until now I've been sharing with him like, Oh, I like, uh, extensions because mm -hmm. I like to have more hair and I will talk about my hair loss but I will say I always said hair loss I never said alopecia and so when I finally shared with him I like you said it was like I I left it away from my shoulders yeah because he is the single most important person in my life and if he was gonna love me like that with alopecia then that's all i care about right so that's after i told them my life changed <laughs> yeah same. And like for for me and samir my husband he he didn't care he the thing that mattered most to him was why i hid it in the first place and so he wanted to understand that piece and so he took to the internet to read about more about it and to 
understand kind of the shame that I was holding on to. Yeah. 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 So, so tell me, how did you decide to create um, Have It Aware? Yeah. So we, you know, once I kind of let him into this world, basically we were just sitting on the couch one day we were watching TV and I was just pulling and he just gently grabbed my hand and I said, I wish I had something that notified me that wasn't you. It's, it's like, I don't want someone else to tell me what to do. And so that was the aha moment of like, yeah, if I just knew when it was happening, mm -hmm. then I could actually affect change in my life. Because it's, a, like I said, it's a very trance-like behavior. We want to stop, but we just, we just can't. The conversation in our mind is pull, pull, pull. Oh, just get that one. Just get that one. Oh, that one feels funny. You got to get that curly one that feels frizzy. You gotta, and you just keep going, you keep going, you keep going. So it, do you get to a point where you don't feel pain? Like yeah, not you to you it's not painful. It's not okay. people are doing it because it feels good. It's like wow. a sense of relief. It's in the moment. If you, I mean, like you may feel a tinge of pain as you're pulling it out, but really there's that sense of like accomplishment. There's that sense of, um, you know, the, the, some research has come out that says it's also linked to perfectionism. So, you know, you're trying to, for me, it was trying to keep my eyebrows clean because I had very bushy eyebrows. So there's that, that sense of accomplishment, like, oh, I got it. Um, and that sense of perfectionism. So all of that's kind of rooted in, in the behavior and in the, the why of why you engage in these behaviors. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then, so then you guys started t testing products or how yeah. did you so end up working? So we started out trying to figure out um, how it could work. We actually have, um, we started out just going to Michael's and trying to test out this hypothesis of if I know where my hands are, will it help me stop the behavior? So I was wearing like this bangle with uh, jingle bells on it. And whenever my hand went up, it would just make a lot of noise. And so I was like, okay, I, you know, it's, it's not perfect, but it's starting to work. Um, and then we went to technical prototypes. Well, first, we didn't really know how to build something. So we, we live here in Minneapolis and we had friends in the technology community and we just started sharing I, I mean I had to share that I had a mental health condition and then share I have this business idea or this product idea um, and people just started kind of connecting us and slowly but surely the doors started opening to meeting our John and Kirk our two technical co-founders who really built the product and got it to work for me and so this was um, a prototype that I would be wearing at my office uh, you know, we were all still doing day jobs and stuff and, uh, and this started to work. And then we said, okay, we kind of just kept going, kept going, kept going. Then we got to uh, another prototype that, um, you know, people could alpha test and beta test with us. It was just a 3d printed case, um, with just like watch straps that you can get off of Amazon just to get on people's wrists to get people, get input and feedback. Mm -hmm. Um, to finally getting it to the manufacturing state where, you know, our goal was to make it look very discreet, just like an activity tracker. So it blends mm -hmm. in and it's just between you and the bracelet, that behavior and learning to build awareness of where your mm -hmm. hands are and learning to take control. Mm -hmm. So do, are you not pulling your hair anymore? Yeah. So I have really heightened my awareness. I um, don't ascribe to the pull free um mentality because for me it's it's a it's a chronic mental health condition someone mm -hmm. with diabetes does not declare a diabetes free day this is about mm -hmm. learning to manage your behavior manage your condition manage your mental health mm -hmm. learning to keep building that toolkit like this is a toolkit that helps you build awareness right awareness mm -hmm. is that first step of cognitive behavioral therapy once you are aware then you can choose healthier behaviors and it's up to you to decide what are the right healthy behaviors for you deep breathing works for me but you might find it agitating you know like right. some people are like i can't do that i just it makes me hyperventilate when i try to mm -hmm. sit and focus on deep breathing um someone may like to draw super intricate designs or someone may like to color or someone may like to play with the fidget cube 
I like to drink water. I like to do deep breathing and I like to do just get up and stretch and kind of walk around my office. So everyone Mm -hmm. has to learn what works for them. And so I pull a whole whole lot less, you know, it's like one or two hairs instead of a hundred hairs. Um, but for me, it's really about managing the condition, much like someone with diabetes has to prick their finger every day and check their blood sugar levels in the same way you have to keep checking in with yourself to make sure you are in a good, you know, equilibrium state of energy. Mm -hmm. So tell us how can we, how can we buy Keen? Do you, is it selling in Amazon? How can we access it? Yep. So we sell directly on our website at habitaware.com. We're also on Amazon. Um, And we are, have shipped to maybe more than 50 countries. We have about a thousand treatment professionals that recommend it to their clients. And we're continuously improving the product based on customer feedback. So we truly Mm want to make sure that you succeed too. So, you know, the way that it works is you connect to a mobile app and you train it for that specific behavior that you mm-hmm. do. So mine just vibrated because that's the, that's the scanning motion that I do. Okay. Um, and that vibration is just shifting it from the subconscious to the conscious so that you can now affect change. So we, mm-hmm. if you are having trouble, you know, training it for your specific behavior, we do free video calls to make sure mm-hmm. that we get you set wow. up. For success. We are very invested in your health and recovery, knowing full well that we are making change in people's lives and we don't want anyone that's purchasing our product to not have that same, uh, you know, trajectory. Experience. Yeah. yeah. Have you worked a lot with kids? We do have a lot of kids in our keen family, as we call them. We have a lot of kids and we have a lot of parents sometimes buying for their child. The biggest thing we tell parents is the child needs to be ready. You cannot, put this on. It's not a magic bullet. It's not going to make them stop. It's going to make them Mm -hmm. aware and they Mm -hmm. will need to learn what that means for them and and how they're going to take control, how they're going to, you know, keep, keep a system, like build a system to help themselves make that positive change. And we're with you every step of that way. Mm -hmm. And so this is, this is not something that is genetic or like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know if maybe your children will have trichotillomy. Yeah, you know, it's really hard to know. There's not enough research. There's okay. just not enough research. Right now, there's a, that, that major nonprofit, BFRB.org, they are funding a lot of research in this space. We also have a research grant from the National Institute of Health mm-hmm. and the National Science Foundation for the product and the behaviors kind of um, proving out how does it work and, um, and helping us improve the product. Um, but there's just not enough research to know, is it genetic? Is it hormonal? Is it environment? Is it trauma? Like what's causing it? I personally think it's a mixture of all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and you'll see sometimes in these groups where parents will say, I pull in front of my kids. I'm so scared. They're going to learn it from me. And, you know, and that, that sometimes happens like, yeah, if, if that's how you do it, sometimes that might be the way that they learn, Um, and so, but if you can, and, but it's a teaching moment, right? Like if you can, if you can be strong enough to share with your child, like I have this imperfection and I'm working on it Mm -hmm. and I'm trying to do deep breathing or I'm taking time, you know, daddy's taking time to go to yoga or mommy's taking time to go to yoga to, to make sure that I have a calm state of mind so that I can take control of this. Then you're teaching your child, like, oh, this is how this is a good way, a healthy way of taking control of, of when my mind gets in these restless states. Yeah. I love that. And I also know that you have, you have been very generous and you have a gift for our audience. Uh, Do you want to tell us about it? Yes. So we are offering 15% off of our bracelet, as well as including a free ebook, which um, is called Love, Strength, and Awareness, Overcoming Trichotillomania and how you can, over, how you can overcome trichotillomania um, using a lot of what I've learned and what I've been practicing for the last few years. Thank you so much. And so the last thing that I wanted to ask you is, what would you say to people that are, going, that are living with trichotillomania that are still hiding? Yeah, again, I would say like I said before, the secrets make you sick the moment and you, you don't need to share with the world. You don't need to share with, you know, some, you, you just need to 
you just need to let it go however you define that. Maybe it's writing it down. Uh, maybe it's journaling about the pain that you've been going through. Maybe it's confiding in a loved one, a best friend, a boyfriend, a husband, a parent. Mm -hmm. Just get it off your chest because I think the key is in this. We spend so much time and energy hiding. Mm -hmm. Just consider what will happen when you spend all of that same time and energy in healing, right? Mm -hmm. So that is, the, that is the key that I want to impart on people. And I personally have turned my pain into my purpose, helping people with this condition. So you can, I'm happy to talk with anyone that may want to. Um, I'm, I'm here for you. Thank you, Neela. And that's exactly why I invited you because I love how you made uh, this your mission, your purpose, and how you're changing lives uh, all, all over the world uh, with just taking that step, right? It's stepping up for you and not only you were able to come to the other side, but you're bringing others with you. And I think that's amazing. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much for being with us today and for your gift and your generosity. I really Thank you. Oh, well, thank you for your kindness and allowing me to join this amazing summit. I'm so excited to be here.